Father, as we come to your word, we thank you again for the truth that you have revealed to us uh, in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the new life that you have given to us, and we want to express that life, Father, in every area of our lives, and especially as we think of our families. So we look to you and to your word for that encouragement this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to begin this morning a new series of studies. We finished up Second Peter a couple of weeks ago, and so we're going to begin this morning a new series on the family. We want to look at how it is that we can live within the context of the family and do it in God's way, do it in the way that God has laid out for us in his word, and certainly he has been faithful to show us uh, so many different passages that speak to how it is that we are to live and conduct our lives within our individual families. So we're going to spend uh, an undetermined number of weeks, six, eight, ten, we'll see how this goes, uh, and we'll just look ahead to see what it is that God wants us to undertake as we come each week. We'll kind of focus on a central passage and use that as a launch point to uh, see what it is that God would have for us as we think in terms of life in the family. I recognize that as we do that, that there is a full range of emotions and responses to any time you talk about the family. Uh, For some people, talking about the family brings back wonderful memories. Uh, As you think of your growing up years, especially those of us that are older, maybe as you think of your family and you think of what that looked like, it was a wonderful blessing and and, uh, you reflect back on that with a lot of joy. Uh, That certainly was my experience uh, growing up in a family with a godly father and a godly mother. I was right in the middle of seven children. I had three sisters that were older than me. Other than the hand-me-down issue in those early years, everything was pretty good. Uh, but, But as I look back on my growing up years, that certainly brings to my mind many positive memories. And even now, as we get together as a family, it's always a very positive time. For other people, however, it's not that way. For some of you, when you hear the word family, you think of anything but happy. You think of anything but joyful. You think of anything but good memories. For some people, when they hear the word family and reflect on what it was like growing up in their home, it, in fact, brings sadness to their heart. They have a lot of memories that are are bad, a lot of memories that are difficult, a lot of memories that are painful. So we we come to this study with a, a full range of backgrounds, don't we? many, many different experiences, and we want to trust God to work in each of our lives. So here's what we want to ask God to do over the course of these next couple of months. We want to ask God to, to help us to see that as, as Christians within the context of marriage and the family, I, I believe if we're going to flourish in the way that the Scriptures put this forward, I think what we want to ask God to do is to show us a biblical understanding of what his plan is for marriage and the family. And obviously, marriage is a key part of that, isn't it? So we want to have a biblical understanding. We're not interested in just having a cultural understanding. We're not interested in having some Christian ideas that then get kind of mixed in with the world's thinking and philosophy. But what we really want to ask God to do is ground us first and foremost in the truth of Scripture and what he says to us about the context of living within the family. And, and then, having that in place, we want to ask God for the commitment to live that out every day. Because that's really the essence of how it is that God would enable us as Christian families and Christian marriages to flourish and grow in the way that he intends. It's one thing to, to know what it is that the Bible teaches, then it's another thing, isn't it, to be committed to living that out Uh, day to day to day. And so when we do this and we talk about the family, I really think that the things that we're going to talk about are going to be applicable to everybody, Uh, whether you are married or whether you're single, whether you have children or you do not have children, Uh, whether you're widowed or whether you're divorced, whatever your circumstance is. And the reason I say that is because when you talk about family living, it's really all about living out the gospel, isn't it? It's really God's call upon us in whatever our context is to just live out the gospel. When the Apostle Paul began in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians, and and he put forward in that chapter, at the end of that chapter and on into chapter 6, some wonderful principles about family living, he began that fifth chapter by saying this, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to us as a fragrant aroma. 
And, and so when you come to that really baseline passage in Ephesians, and we'll go there one morning and, and, and look at what it is that is said to fathers and mothers and children and, and how it is that they're to relate within the context. He starts off that section by saying, you know what we need? All of us need to obey God and to live out the gospel and to allow the love of Christ to be evident in our life every day. So I think we want to be encouraged that we're really looking at a topic that, that speaks to all of us in some regard, and that's the way we want to look at this. So let's start this morning by looking at where we are today where we are today, and I want to have you think with me about a couple of things. And the first one is, and I think everybody would agree with me on this, that we're living in the middle of a cultural crisis, and we're living in the middle of growing confusion about what the Christian home and Christian family and Christian marriage is to look like. Or just speaking to our culture and society at large, what is family? What is marriage? We're living in a day of cultural confusion a cultural crisis and, and growing confusion about what that looks like. And so I know at this point I could simply throw on the screen a whole bunch of, of uh, statistics that would overwhelm us. And, and in fact, we've all seen them so many times, I think we just get numb to them and what's going on because we're living it, we're seeing it, we're watching it happen within the context of our own society and our own culture. So as we come to this, I want to just lay out three things that I think are, are, are in essence a part of this picture of what's going on today. And the first one is that, uh, that foundations are literally being destroyed. Foundations that, that we think of with regard to the home and the family and marriage are being destroyed. Nothing is more important to a structure. Anybody that does any building knows that nothing is more important to a structure than the foundation. If there isn't a proper, strong, solid foundation, it doesn't matter how beautiful that structure is, it's going to have problems at some point. So David in Psalm 11 verse 3 says this, if the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? In a recent survey by a Christian research firm, they asked Christian families to list what they believed were the top issues facing them as Christian families. And as you look at this list of 10 things that these families said were issues that they were facing, anti-Christian culture, divorce, busyness, absent father figure, lack of discipline, uh, financial pressures, lack of communication, negative, and you look down that list. And, and as I looked at that list, and I don't know how this question was put out there, but as I looked at that list, it almost looks to me like this is a list of symptoms These certainly cannot be listed as causes for why foundations are being shaken. These are all symptoms of things that are going on within the context of Christian marriages and Christian families. And we need to get back behind these things and ask the more pressing question, what are the causes for these symptoms that we see expressed here? They almost, in some regards, become... Uh, ways for us to shift the blame from ourselves to other things and other people. And I think what God would call us to as we talk about living out the gospel, I think what God would call every one of us to is is a sense of honesty before him as to where we are and how it is that this looks within our own life and within our own family. So as you look at those things, I just want you to go back to the opening statement that we made. We can't look at both of them at the same time. But as you look at those, those things, that list... And then I come back to our opening statement, and it is to have a biblical understanding, a bi- not, not a cultural understanding of marriage, not even the culture within the Christian community of what marriage is, but a biblical understanding of marriage and a biblical understanding of the family. And then when we take that and we make that commitment to live out that truth, that addresses all of these symptoms very specifically. I mean, when, when the number one thing on the list is, well, we live in a very anti-Christian culture, really. What, what have God's people lived in for all of time? Why is it that God called the children of Israel out of the culture that they lived in so that they would be a people of his own? Because they were living in an anti-God, anti-Christian, if you will, culture of that day. That's why Paul says in Philippians that we're to shine as lights in the world because we're living in the midst of an evil and perverse and a wicked generation. 
among whom you shine as lights. We, we can't say the reason our families are struggling, the reason our marriages are failing is because we live in an anti-Christian culture. That's a symptom of things that are happening. That's shifting blame to somebody else rather than looking at ourselves. Divorce. Well, when you take the principles of the Word of God with regard to how it is that He is wanting us to live within the context of marriage, how does that impact the way we deal with problems within our marriages? Well, it it, it changes everything. And you just work your way down that list. Busyness? Busyness? Really? Busyness? That's personal choices, isn't it? The fact that you have families going in 50 different directions, that's a symptom of a deeper problem. You look at the life of Jesus. He was a busy man, but he knew about how to step back, didn't he? He knew what solitude was. He knew how to slow down. He knew how to set the pace of his life. So I I look at everything on that list, and I say, God, help me, help us have a biblical worldview, have a biblical understanding of what you want from us within marriage and within the family. Help us live that truth out. And then these things, it seems to me, take care of themselves. So we are in every way seeing the foundations of our, of our marriage and, and families brought under attack. Secondly, we have yielded to, to moral relativism. We've simply yielded to moral relativism. Again, uh, this is just something that you are so very aware of as well. I was reminded this past week that this is now the 25th anniversary of Alan Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind. And I didn't realize it was 25 years ago that he wrote that book. Now, Alan Bloom was writing within the circles of academia when he wrote this book. And and Alan Bloom is not a Christian. He is not a professor of uh, uh, what we would think of as Christian biblical family values by any stretch. All right? He writes from a very different perspective. But within this book, 25 years ago, almost prophetic as we come to 2012, he, he talked about the fact of what he sees happening within the lives of freshman students that would come to him within his classroom and the changes that were going on in the, our culture at that time. And he talked about this moral relativism. He talked about the fact that we're now living within the fog of, of, of choices in which something may be wrong for you, but it's right for me. Something's right for you, but it's wrong for me. And, and he pointed out uh, that what he had seen previously was at least within the lives of these students that had come to him in in previous uh, decades was that there was some understanding primarily from a Judeo-Christian heritage that there was something that was absolutely true and something that was absolutely right and something that was absolutely wrong. Now, today we live in such a moral fog that we are now, as you know, we're redefining what a marriage is. And we're not going to stop in that definition by saying it's just two people who love each other. That's where we are now. We've, we've yielded the definition of a man and a woman. Our government will not even defend the Right to Marriage Act, which is to say marriage is between a man and a woman. We, we've, we've let that definition go, and it's now just two people who love each other. Well, we don't need to think for a moment that a decade from now or less that marriage isn't going to evolve and be defined into something else, isn't it? It's not going to necessarily be limited to just two people who love each other. It may take on other manifestations. And the same is true of a family. We can't even define a family anymore. We don't know what a family is. The ramifications to our culture, to our society, are far-reaching, way beyond what anybody would have ever thought or predicted when you leave the moral basis of the Word of God and the truth of God. So here we are. We're living in this cultural crisis with moral confusion all around us, and we're living in a time of moral relativism. And then thirdly, what I think we see is that we are a nation under judgment. We're a nation under judgment. I don't know what you hear when I say that. I don't know what you think that means. I don't know what goes through your mind when you hear me say, I think we're a nation under judgment. But when I read in Romans chapter 1 and and the account that the Holy Spirit of God gave to us through the Apostle Paul, And you begin reading at about verse 18 and all the way to the end of the chapter. I don't see how you can come to any other conclusion that life that is lived in this fallen world as we know right now is a cosmic spiritual battle between God and Satan. There is a cosmic spiritual battle that is going on between God and Satan. 
And it seems to me that one of the things that you can draw out of this passage is that one of the main arenas in which that battle is taking place is the, is the battle of marriage and family. And, and the home is at the, kind of the center of that because it's the foundation stone of all that goes on within a culture and a society. And so what we see around us by way of moral chaos is reflective of a nation that is under judgment. What we see by way of violence... I mean, it's tragic, isn't it? The violence that takes place within America on any given day, the loss of life of one person taking the life of another. Uh, we, we have no value for life. And it, it happens in the workplace. It happens in schools. It happens in churches. It happens in neighborhoods. Uh, we, we live in a time of, uh, of, of just taking life so f- uh, f- uh, frivolously. We're, we mock God, don't we? As a, as a society, as a culture, we, we mock God. The media is consumed with, with sensuality. And so you, you recount these things, and you look at the 24th verse of Romans 1, and there Paul says, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. And then you read a little bit farther on, and, and, and he says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So the witness within their conscience before it gets so seared by sin, is to say, that's the way to go. That's truth. But over time, they they become deadened to that, and they exchange God's truth for a lie. And they decide that, well, we don't really need the definition in the Bible for a marriage or for a family. We can come up with our own, and it's okay. There aren't really any long-lasting consequences. Well, God says He has given them over. So He says it again in verse 26, God gave them over. And then you read for the third time in verse 28 that they left the natural for the unnatural. And we know that is all around us. They left the natural for the unnatural, and they did not acknowledge God. And again, God says He gave them over to. And I think that as you read those things, it is a a sobering reminder that we are a nation and a people under God's judgment. This is just the carrying out of the laws of God. God is a, a God of law. He's a God of order. And he puts certain things into place, and those things run their course, and that's what we are experiencing right now. God will not be mocked. And what we as a people and what we as a culture and what we as a society sow, then we're going to reap that, aren't we? So you look at those first few points there, and it's pretty sobering. It's kind of sad. In fact, it, it causes us at times to be very discouraged. And you might capture this by saying, this is the bad news, isn't it? This is bad news about what's going on within our families, within our marriages, within the church and within the culture itself. But we're not left there. We, we were, we're not left just simply to curse the darkness, but we are called to turn on some lights. So let's do that. Let's look then secondly at what we need is the biblical truth to, to rebuild and to fortify and to strengthen these foundations. And again, it starts with God. And again, if you just look at that list of things, I I, I think that you bring the truth of God to bear on those things, and God will enable us to take each one of those things that may, in fact, in some way, be an issue that we're facing as a a culture and as a church and, and individual families, and God will bring His Word to bear on each one of those and help us to see our way through what that looks like and what that means. Because the fact of the matter is, We have to begin with putting God at the center of everything. God needs to be at the center of everything in order for us to to do battle with those things that are listed there. And and we're going to give our life to something, aren't we? We're going to give our life to something. We're going to give our life to our job. We're going to give our life to our career. We're going to give our life to uh, our family. We're going to give our life to our children. We're going to talk about that at some point. You, You... We shouldn't be called as parents to give our life to our children in the sense that they become the center focus of everything and all that goes on within our life and our family. We raise our children to give them away. We raise our children to send them out. That's a pretty significant principle. And so we have to decide, what what is it that we're going to focus our life on? Is it going to be on some hobby, some, some pursuit? Is it going to be on material things? The fact of the matter is, everybody in this room this morning... There's an answer to the question, what's at the center of your heart? What's at the center of your life? 
What is it that you're giving yourself to more than anything else? And I want to argue with you that it needs to be God. God needs to be at the center of all of this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And guess what? Everything else will be added. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Set your affection, therefore, on things above, not on things on the earth. So you can just go through passage after passage after passage in which God calls us to put him at the center of everything. So if you turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1, we're going to stay here in Proverbs 1 for a little bit. Proverbs is filled with all kinds of things for family life. And so we'll probably find our way to Proverbs on more than one occasion. But let's just briefly look at Proverbs chapter 1, and I'd like to put before you six principles that come out of verses 7 through 9. So let me just read these verses, and then we'll look at these things together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head. The first thing that I would put before you is the fact that the family is God's idea. Now, the cool thing on your outline this morning is all these things are already filled in, right? So I don't see anybody having to write. That was just a punch on the button on the computer, and you got the bonus today. You got everything filled in. Don't expect that all the time in the future, and certainly don't expect that on quiz day. So uh, here here we see that the the family is God's idea, right? The family is God's idea. It's a part of God's plan. That's why when we talk about family living God's way, we're acknowledging, yeah, this is his idea. This is what he has given to us. This wasn't an evolutionary development. This wasn't a societal discovery. This wasn't something that people thought up as as time went along and they just kind of formed into these groups. No, what we know from Scripture is that the family flows out of the creation story. The family flows out of, out of the, the, the book of Genesis, chapter 1. And in, and in that chapter, in verse 27, this is what we read, Genesis 1, 27, that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, that's a snapshot of God giving to us the initial account of a family, of what he had created and what he did. How are they to do that? How are they to do verses 27 and 28? God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and the other things. How are they supposed to do that? Well, they're supposed to do it according to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 in this way. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That, that's God's idea. That's God's plan. That's God putting before us the principle of marriage and family living and how it is that he wants to see that happen. So we begin with the understanding that God's idea is that there be families, a man and a woman. And if he blesses that relationship and that union, children are a part of that. The second thing that I would have you note from this passage in Proverbs 1 is that the family is the place where life makes up its mind. The family is the place where life makes up its mind. I borrowed that statement, that phrase from Dr. Howard Hendricks, who would say that repeatedly in our family life and marriage class from eons ago. And he'd always say, yeah, your home, your family is where life is going to make up its mind. And he was just simply saying that as your kids grow up within your family, that's God's basic schoolroom. That, that's where they're learning how it is that they're going to live their life. That's, that's how they're learning what is valuable. That's how they're learning what they want to give themselves to. That's how they're learning what it is that's supposed to be the center of their life. And, and so that's really the place where life makes up its mind. It's amazing. The human species, as we're born into this world, there are a few things that come to us naturally but really not that many things that we can just naturally figure out and do on our own, right? I mean, it's not like the wild. When you watch television, National Geographic or something, and you see how other species come into this world and and how quickly they're left by their parents. I mean, it's amazing at times, isn't it, that that they are able to make it and get to where they need to be. That doesn't happen with us. 
we come into this world with very few natural things that we just figure out all on our own, and that's by design. God gave us that so that our parents would then be the ones who would teach us these many, many, many other things that we need to learn at others, so that the family then becomes like the schoolroom. Now, there are other things that can be of help, like a church. But you realize that the church has your children for one, two, three hours at the most a week. You get them for the other 165. Now, you might want for us to have them more hours than that, but that's basically what we get, right? And, and so when you look at that on balance, you can say, yeah, the church is there to help, and absolutely we want to be there to help. We're gonna, we want to talk about that a lot more. But the reality is other institutions can come along and help, but ultimately it falls to the parents. It falls to dad. It falls to mom. They're the ones who are going to be responsible. They're the ones who are going to be accountable. Why? Because the home, the family, is where life makes up its mind. Thirdly, the focus is to be the fear of the Lord, right? Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We've, we've memorized that verse. We know that little verse from a long time ago. That truth simply is that we're to be integrating all of life into the family living. And, and, and that integration of life all revolves around the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is nothing less than, than simply understanding who God is, Right? It's understanding and reverencing God. It's having a, an understanding of the awesomeness of our God. It's bringing the, the glory of God uh, into every aspect of life. And so that there isn't a part of life that gets segregated away, that, that gets broken up into pieces and, well, that's my spiritual... No, it's all integrated around that wonderful statement that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it is the Word of God that informs and brings that about. And so we have that understanding within the context of family life where life is making up its mind that God is the one that we worship. God is the one that we fear. And then the fourth thing, the instruction is given by fathers and mothers. Again, you look at verse 8, hear my son your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. So fathers and mothers share equally in this process. Now, they may have different roles in that process, but they share in that together. He doesn't say, fathers, teach, and, and, and mothers, uh, I know you're going to be cooking and cleaning and changing diapers, so you, you're too... No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, uh, dad, go off to work, and mom, you teach. He doesn't say, dad, you go off to work, and mom, you go off to work, and we find somebody... Else. No, it is fathers and mothers who are to do this together, a shared responsibility, a shared privilege that they have. And then the fifth thing, the role of children is that of submission and obedience to their parents. The role of children is that of submission and obedience. Again, you look at verse 8, and there are two commands in that verse. The first one has to do with hearing, hear my son, your father's instruction. And then the second one says, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. It warns against the very common tendency of rebellion against authority, right? something that all of us struggle with in different ways, even all through life, uh, submitting to those in authority over us. And I'm, I'm wondering if in that verse we don't have two different pictures of what this family life looks like and what growing up looks like and what this means to listen and obey and submit to your parents. It seems, first of all, that the idea of hearing that the child is in the context of the home. So the child is there to hear, to hear your mother's voice, to hear your father's voice, right? You're there. Every child, every teenager knows the temptation to not hear the voice of their mom or their dad when they are being spoken to or when they're being called, right? They're there, but they're really not there. They're there, but they're not listening. So his first admonition, his first command is, when you're there, you need to be listening to them. And then I'm wondering if that second part where he says, uh, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Do not forsake your mother's teaching if that isn't understanding and, and realizing that there's a context when they're away from home. And so when you're home and you're hearing, you're there, you're to listen and obey. Even when you're not there, physically, in the home, you're somewhere else. 
You're not supposed to forsake the teaching of either your father or your mother, but you're supposed to remember what it is that they have told you. You don't turn away from what you've been taught, whether you're here or whether you're there. And then the sixth point, there is the promise of reward. The promise of reward in verse 9. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. The, the very first word of verse 9, indeed, could actually be translated because. This, is a, this flows out of everything else that has been said. The point is that as you grow this way, as you grow up this way, you realize that this is a place of blessing. This is a place of glory. This is a place of joy. This is a place of privilege. When you're in that kind of a setting, it's like being given a gift. You have a mom and a dad, or you have a dad or a mom, whatever it is that that family unit constitutes. And we fully understand and fully embrace and fully want to encourage those of you that are single parents. Toughest job in the world, but one that we admire you for doing so much. But here, this statement brings to mind that in that place where you are loved by a father and a mother, it's a place of joy. It's a place of blessing. It's a place of grace. And God commands, and then he fully invests that command with the promise. And you see that in other places. For instance, in Proverbs 14 and verse 26, in the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. Verse 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. The things that you're going to avoid as you listen and as you obey, and you're going to be rewarded for that. Uh, Proverbs 19 and verse 23 says this, the fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. The fear of the Lord is that theme that runs through those various points. So I want you to see one other, one other thing with regard to this building of the foundation. I want you to see then secondly that our hope is in the promises of God. Our hope is in the promises of God. And I would invite you to turn back just a couple pages to Psalm 127. And Psalm 127 and really 127 and 28 almost seem like they go together, but we're just going to read 127. And there it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who built it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. This is really a word in particular to parents in this uh, section of Psalm 127. And I just want to put before you three things as we launch into this series together. And the first is that putting our hope in God will really put pride in its place. When we put our hope in God and in the promises of God, then it helps us to put pride in its rightful place. It's the Lord who builds, isn't it? It's the Lord who guards. It's the Lord who protects. It's the Lord that I'm trusting to work in the life of my children, even when I can't see what He's doing. Now, it doesn't free us of any responsibility. Obviously, we have all the responsibilities that Scripture gives to us. But it helps us to put the big picture in place to realize, no, God is the one who works in hearts. God is the one who brings about life change. God is the one who's to be trusted. God's promises are where I am putting my hope and my emphasis. I'm going to be humble before him. I'm going to walk in humility before him. Every parent needs, of course, to learn, and we learn that pretty naturally, I think, don't we? The importance of just walking humbly before God and recognizing and trusting God to help us to accomplish the things that he wants to see happen in the lives of our children. We know that the Lord resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We know that Micah the prophet said, what it is that we are to do, what it is that the Lord requires of you that you do justice, you love kindness, and you walk humbly with your God. And so we want to do that as parents as we go through this process, as we trust God with this matter of our children when they're young and when they're old and all of the time in between. We put our hope in God and in the promises of God and we allow that to speak to our sense of pride recognizing what God alone can do. Secondly, we put our hope in God and it frees us from worry. 
I mean, if we were to put a list together of things that as parents we struggle with, probably if you're like me, one of the things that would be somewhere pretty high on your list is anxiety and worry about your children. It's just a response that we have, isn't it? We love them. We want to see them do well. We see them going through the issues of life and and our heart hurts for them at times, and we want to be there to encourage them and bless them. So uh, this is a statement in verse 2 of of one who's trusting in the Lord. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of someone who has cast their cares upon the Lord, isn't it? It's a picture of someone who's trusting God to do what only he can do, to give the peace and the uh, rest that only God can give and replace the anxiety and the stress and the worry. Uh, Isaiah 26.3 reminds us that we have great peace. We have great peace when our trust is in God. And so the Scriptures speak to that. Proverbs 30, uh, 3, uh, 3 and verse 24 says, When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Anybody here want sweet sleep? For any number of reasons, we want that, don't we? But here his promise is, you put your hope in God, you put your trust in God, and God will give you sweet rest and sweet sleep. And then finally, putting our hope in God releases his grace into our lives. And that's what we all need, isn't it? We need the release of God's grace into our lives. So we put our hope in God and in the promises of God, and he releases his grace into our lives. The grace that allows us to see our children the way God does. What does he say here in Psalm 127? He says, behold, children are a gift of the Lord. They're a blessing in our lives, aren't they? Grace to see our children as he does. Grace to respond to each and every family circumstance with a spirit of grace and mercy and compassion. Grace to love, grace to bless, grace to forgive, grace to encourage. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech, let your speech always be with grace. And so as we focus our attention as parents on the promises of God, He gives to us grace for our life. We need a biblical understanding of what marriage is and what the family is, and then we need that commitment to put those truths into practice in our lives every day. Three things as we close. What do we take away? Well, no church, no community, no nation ever rises higher than its spiritual condition of its families. That's why we're in the situation that we're in, right? That's why we're in the trouble that we are. It's because there is such an attack that is going on against families, and we need to be repairing that foundation. And as a church, we want to do everything that we can. Yes, we only have your children and your young people for a short amount of time in in the course of a 168-hour week. But you know what? We want to do everything that we can to be a part of the equipping process, part of the blessing process. That's why we expend a significant amount of our resources to pour into the lives of children and those who minister to children and students and those who minister to students and parents, and that's what we're about. We want to be about the business of equipping and helping you in that process so that we have, as a church family, uh, foundations that are strong and secure. Secondly, we want to be encouraged. We want to be encouraged in the midst of this that is at times wearying and difficult and hard. We want to be encouraged that God is with us and His promises are all that we need so that when we do trust in the Lord with all of our heart, that we are confident that He is the one who is going to see us through, whatever that looks like, because He alone is sufficient. We want to be encouraged because God has given to us everything that we need. He is sufficient for all that comes our way. And then lastly, we want to be steadfast. You have to be steadfast, don't you? You have to be steadfast, and you have to make the determination to never quit, to never give up, to keep on keeping on, to press into it, and to move forward, trusting, asking, believing, claiming the, the statement of, of uh, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight: Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the call that God has given to us. This is the privilege that we have as a church family and as individual families and as individuals to seek what it is that God would have for us in terms of, God, give us a greater glimpse of what a biblical marriage, biblical family looks like, and then help us to commit to that, Father, for your glory 
and for the, the furtherance of the gospel of your grace. Well, that's where we're headed. Let's pray, and we will carry on. Gracious Father, thank you this morning for the blessing of every family that is a part of a covenant and those, Father, that you would desire for us to reach and touch and to bless. We are so very thankful for all of the, the different ministries that you raise up within our body, the different ways that we can touch uh, the family, the marriage units within our church and those within our community. And, Father, we want to pray right now and we want to ask that you will bless these weeks that are before us, that you will give to us a, a great desire to see life from a biblical perspective, to see how it is that you want to teach us through the many experiences that you bring us through, and do it, Father, all for your glory, all for the furtherance of your name, all for the grace and the gospel of God to be extended within this place and all of the places that you allow us to touch. So we are excited, Lord, about the fact that you are at work, that you have committed yourself to this process. And we thank you for all of these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.